Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and today I will explore how West Virginia obtained statehood from Virginia in the middle of the Civil War. To discuss statehood of West Virginia, we actually have to travel back in time to Virginia's Constitutional Convention in 1850 to 1851. Within those debates over a new state constitution, we see the radical differences between Eastern and Western Virginia. Like many debates in the first half of the 19th century, it devolved around slavery and how the enslaved should be counted toward representation, just like the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, when the delegates from their respective states debated the same exact issue, whether the slave population would count toward the representation in Congress. The Philadelphia Convention eventual compromise stated that three-fifths of the state's population of slaves would help determine how many representatives in Congress each state would have. In Virginia, its delegates debated the same question, how representation would be allocated for their bicameral legislature. The western portion of Virginia wanted representation based solely on the white population, but the eastern portion wanted it based on both the enslaved and non-enslaved population. Just like in 1787, they compromised, and the lower house of the bicameral legislature was based on the white population and the upper house was based on both white and enslaved populations. Clearly, there was a political divide between the two. To say that West Virginia was void of slaves would be wrong. There was a slave population in what is now West Virginia, but it paled in comparison to the rest of Virginia. In 1860, there were 490,308 slaves, approximately 30% of the total population in Eastern Virginia. In Western Virginia, there were 18,451 slaves, about 4% of the total population. You wouldn't find that many actual plantations in the style of those in the Deep South, so slaves worked as staff at resorts like hot springs or they would work in mining operations. Suffice it to say, slavery in the mountains looked a lot different than in flatter terrain, but it was still holding people in bondage and forcing them to work. West Virginia may have been anti-slavery, but they were not in any sense abolitionists. To be more specific, they were anti-slavery toward the institution in their state. The tax breaks made the wealthy slave owners more wealthy, and that group's political power alienated the western counties and deprived them of representation. Furthermore, their anti-slavery stance was also anti-black. They did not just want slavery out of their state, but free blacks as well. As one historian put it, acknowledging the region's anti-slavery stance did not involve abolitionism or free soilism or any other ism, deemed in any quarter disreputable, but is simply the assertion of manly equality of the citizens of a sovereign state. The area's hatred for slavery reflected its disdain for black people, and Northwestern Virginians' anti-slavery vision was nearly as exclusionist as Eastern Virginians' advocacy of the expulsion of free blacks. They believed that slavery's westward expansion debased white society and threatened the economic and moral health of democracy. This divide between the two sections of the state of Virginia brought about a secession movement in 1853 by the panhandle of the state that was sandwiched between Ohio and Pennsylvania. The panhandle wanted to be annexed by Pennsylvania because they believed they had more in common with them and would gain more political power being part of that state. However, the movement was snuffed out by politicians in the East. In early 1860, when the legislature considered raising taxes to finance military mobilization, Northwesterners objected to a tax on wool, a product raised mostly in western Virginia, while eastern tobacco, corn, and wheat remained untaxed. This reflected a large tax policy that exempted slaves under age 12 and only nominally taxed other slaves, while taxing land and livestock according to their full value. A Northwestern newspaper complained that the tax policy sought to encourage and foster slavery. Why should wool growers be singled out as a special subject of taxation? Should Northwestern Virginians serve as bearers of wood and drawers of water for your worse than Egyptian taskmasters? When Lee County's David Miller proposed a resolution in January 1860 equalizing taxation, a Northwesterner concluded that there was no hope that this just and proper resolution will receive any favor at the hands of this legislature. Truly, slave property was privileged. 
When the General Assembly considered legislation in early 1860 to mobilize the Commonwealth militarily, Republican George Porter objected. Representing Brooke and Hancock counties in the House of Delegates, Porter declared that the Panhandle would heartily defend the Union. He suggested, moreover, that his constituents would take up arms against Eastern Virginians should they seek to secede. Porter responded to one of his fellow delegates questioning him by saying, The people, I repeat, will go with Virginia when she is right, but when she is wrong, will probably beg leave to differ from her. As a response to the heavily Democrat East that pushed pro-slavery agendas through the legislature, West Virginia became a bastion for Republicans, especially for that party's anti-slavery stance. Now, with a solid political party back in that region, it gave the eastern portion of the state more trouble politically by opposing legislation that promoted slavocracy. As 1861 dawned, multiple states had already left the Union and Western Virginia newspapers urged Westerners to realize that their interests lay outside of the slaveholding East. Should an illegal or irresponsible convention secede, Westerners should be prepared to separate and form a new state. The seeds of secession from Virginia had already been planted and grown roots by 1861, and the war would provide a way for them to officially break away from the vastly different East. Once Virginia seceded, those folks in Western Virginia felt that their concerns were not heard and the fact that they were so far away from the state capital and its military made it a no-brainer for them to side with the United States because they were much closer to federal authorities. Notably, not all Western Virginians subscribed to this view of the Union, and outside of the Northwest, opinions were decidedly more mixed. In May 1861, the Clarksburg Register expressed its profound mortification about a few citizens of Northwest Virginia who forget the wisdom, patriotism, and prowess of our ancestral dead, the exalted sense of honor which the memory of these inspires, the security, strength, greatness, and influence which her integrity affords, and who would cut off a petty fragment from the other land of our fathers and attach it to that of our most inveterate enemies, would form from a few of the northwestern counties of Virginia a fragmentary corner of Pennsylvania or Ohio, or else remain alone, a petty, feeble, helpless, renegade community on the border of two great confederacies, despised by that which it deserted in the hour of peril, and condemned by that which it should have attached itself for protection. By the summer of 1861, Western Virginians were looking to escape from the Eastern slavocracy. A newspaper described it best when it stated, For three quarters of a century, the Union had sheltered Virginians in sunshine and in storm, made them the admiration of the civilized world, and conferred a designation more honored, more respected, and revered than that of king, the title of American citizen. Would Westerners passively surrender the Republic and submit to be used by the conspirators engaged in this effort to enslave you, as their instruments by which you're enslaved is to be effected. In order to be free, free men must prove themselves worthy to be free, and must themselves first strike the blow. Secession was a deed of darkness, which had been performed in secret conclave by the reckless spirits who accomplished it in contempt of their people, their masters under our form of government. But who the leaders in this work of destruction have determined to enslave? In June 1861, a convention met in Wheeling, labeled the second Wheeling Convention to create a restored government that was loyal to the United States and to break away from Virginia. The convention broke into two camps, one that wanted to immediately break away and one that wanted to wait. Not that they were against separation from Virginia, but they wanted to be cautious. Since they felt no security under the Confederate government at Richmond, the delegates of the second Wheeling Convention decided to set up a new government Branding the Richmond legislature as illegitimate, the delegates declared all state offices vacant and proceeded to elect a new governor and a new legislature for the loyal people of the state. This new government became known as the Restored Government of Virginia, with Francis Pierpont as its governor. Setting up the new government paved the way for the satisfying the first constitutional requirement for separate statehood. They knew that the only way to become a state was to have approval from the federal government and the state from which they wanted to separate. This is where the constitutional battle over West Virginia statehood came into question. The Western Virginians believed that since they were the segment of the population who stayed loyal to the federal government, that they represented the legitimate government of Virginia and, because of that, the federal government had the right to legally acknowledge them as such. 
A win for the restored government came when Abraham Lincoln formally recognized them as the legitimate government of Virginia. Lincoln even took steps to make sure that Congress would recognize the restored government. In his first message to Congress on July 4, 1861, Lincoln gave a brief statement about the restored government. He described this government as consistent of loyal citizens and argued that the federal government was bound to recognize and protect the restored government as being Virginia. Western Virginians could hardly have asked for stronger support from the president. Another success came to the West Virginians when Congress seated their two senators, John Carlisle and Waitman Wiley, recognizing them as the senators from Virginia. Some men in Congress advised them not to seek separation, and if they did so, it should be after the war ended. West Virginians balked at that thought, because as many of them pointed out, if the Union wins, Virginia would be brought back into the Union intact, and the Easterners would take control of the state politics and not let them go. They must act quickly, and it must come before the war ended. Not only was this region supporting the United States politically, but also militarily. An estimated 32,000 soldiers from West Virginia fought for the Union, while only 8,000 fought for the Confederacy. By July 1861, the restored government approved a plan for statehood, and to legitimize it, they sent it to the counties to be voted on by the people. Those counties overwhelmingly approved. While the counties that voted amounted to less than a fifth of Virginia, they still represented a majority of the loyal counties. Statehood supporters felt that those engaged in treason did not deserve an equal place with the loyal citizens. There was a large stumbling block for the statehood argument. Northern states did not want to admit a slave state into the Union, so the restored government put it up for a vote. Most delegates wanted slavery to die out on its own, but some pushed for emancipation, partly for anti-slavery reasons, but partly because it would bring about statehood much sooner. The vote came back, and by one vote, it was decided that emancipation would not be placed in the new state constitution. Even though that idea was shot down, some counties actually put emancipation support on the ballot. The official vote stood at 6,052 for emancipation to 618 against. They hoped that demonstrating the everyday citizen's disdain for the institution would provoke Congress to approve of statehood despite emancipation not being in the constitution. In June 1862, a bill was put forward in the United States Congress to admit West Virginia as a state. The debate would drag on for months. Slavery was the issue most debated. The bill to admit West Virginia stated that after July 4, 1863, the children of all slaves born within that state would be free. This did not go far enough for many members of Congress, one of which being Charles Sumner, who had been brutally beaten in the Senate by Preston Brooks a few years earlier. He stated that, as he put it, no state shall come into this union with this virus. One of the best proponents for West Virginia statehood was the senator from that state, Waitman Wiley. Even though a slaveholder himself, he added an amendment to the bill that stated the ages at which slaves would be free, making gradual emancipation a reality. Many members of Congress took Abraham Lincoln's lead and supported any state that would gradually emancipate slaves because it was going in the right direction politically. When the debate ended in the Senate, the bill passed, but now they had to get it through the House. The House pondered the constitutionality of the situation. Did the restored government actually represent the real Virginia? Many said no, that the restored was illegitimate. However, a representative who had battled against the disloyal throng of citizens in East Tennessee, Horace Maynard, pointed out that Congress seated loyal representatives from seceded states, himself included, and asked the question, did secession change the relation of loyal men? With those considerations, the bill passed in the House. Now it was to be signed by the President, who sought counsel with his cabinet. As he explained, can this government stand if it indulges constitutional constructions by which men in open rebellion against it are to be accounted, man for man, the equals of those who maintain their loyalty to it? If so, their treason against the Constitution enhances their constitutional value. Far from viewing West Virginia statehood as an act of secession, Lincoln considered not recognizing the legitimacy of the restored government as perpetuating secession. Therefore, the federal government had to recognize the government of the loyal people as the only legitimate one for Virginia. 
And if the government consented to the formation of a new state and Congress approved, then all constitutional procedure was satisfied. On June 20th, 1863, West Virginia finally became a state all its own after decades of division between the East and West and years of attempt in statehood. Thank you all so much for watching. This video was a blast to put together and I would like to do something like this for each state eventually. Let me know if you like that idea and want to see it in future videos. Thank you all again. Have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world is his mission. A professor of fortune is a man called historian. Historian.